to a special live edition of Piers Morgan tonight. And welcome to my audience here in the studio. I can promise you, this will be like an hour like you've never heard before, with a man who's never afraid to say exactly what he thinks. Jesse Ventura, the ex-Navy SEAL, superstar wrestler and governor of Minnesota, answers your questions. Why well, he's got no time either for the Democrats or the Republicans. And a surprising theory on who he thinks is behind the anti-American violence in the Middle East. And here he is, Jesse Ventura. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. How are you, sir? Wait, I gotta get some water. <laughs> I gotta get ready for you. I'm well, doing good, Pierce. We are, we've got an hour ahead of us. We cover lots of ground. I want to start, though, with the breaking news today the controversial and apparently secretly taped video of Mitt Romney at a private fundraiser. The person responsible wants to remain anonymous, but New York Magazine reports it was passed along by former President Jimmy Carter's grandson, James Carter IV. CNN has not been able to independently verify the authenticity of the recordings, but let's take a listen. There are 47% of the people who vote for the president no matter what. All right, there are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe that government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's it's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. These are people who pay no income tax. The Romney campaign released a statement in response to the issue, but did not directly mention the videos. It reads, Mitt Romney wants to help all Americans struggling in the Obama economy. As the governor's made clear all year, he's concerned about the growing number of people who are dependent on the federal government, including the record number of people who are on food stamps, nearly one in six Americans in poverty, and the 23 million Americans who are struggling to find work. Mitt Romney's plan creates 12 million new jobs in four years, grows the economy, and moves Americans off of government dependency and into jobs. Jesse Ventura, you were shaking your head, murmuring all sorts of profanities under your breath there. Clearly you're not oh. impressed by Mitt Romney's claim, which effectively boils down, whichever way you look at this and whatever statements he puts out, that half of the American people apparently are, well, as he put it, on the, on the scrounge, not paying tax, victims, and living off the state. What do you make of that? Well, let's start with taxes for a moment. Do you realize, as I cover in my book here, that these major corporations pay lobbyists more than what they pay in taxes. Mm -hmm. These corporations, these corporations that make billions of dollars pay more to lobbyists than what they pay in taxes. And maybe one of the reasons Mitt has that problem is because when did our ill fortune start? Under Bush and Cheney and the Republicans, and you're hearing this from an independent. Because I know enough to know that the economy what you have today in the economy is the result of decisions made about three, four, or five years ago, because that's how long it takes for them to get into this massive economy. So in my opinion, the Republicans are the ones responsible. And when Romney says he's going to create, well, how many million jobs? 12 million was his last bit of That's total hogwash. And I'll tell you why. The only thing a government official can, can create is a government job. So if he's going to create 12 million new jobs, they're going to be paid for by taxes. Because on, on his jobs are thing, created, wait, Pierce, jobs are created in the private sector, not by the president or the government, unless they're government jobs. We're going to come to job stimulation a little later in the show. But on this specific point that Mitt Romney's been, been found on tape at a private fundraiser trying to raise cash, we think a few months ago. But this, this point that basically everyone who votes for Obama, or the vast majority, are victims, don't pay tax, and so on. We, what we believe, this is just a theory, as a theory that you got the 47% may have come from a tax policy centre, which found that 46.4% of households paid no federal income tax in 2011. But most households did pay payroll taxes. And of the 18% of households that paid neither income taxes or payroll taxes, the centre found more than half of those were elderly, and more than a third were not elderly, but had income under $20,000. So when you put it all together like that, this is a bit of a clangor by Mitt Romney. Yeah. This will be portrayed by the Democrats, I think, very strongly from now to the election as a guy dismissing half of America 
as people who are just victims living off the state. Well, it shows me that Mitt Romney probably lives in a world that I don't live in. You know, he lives in a world that uh, I hear he's worth, what, $250 million, and he comes from wealth. And most people I find that are born with that kind of money truly don't know what it's like to be out there. I mean, you know, I remember when I started years ago on my pro wrestling career when I'd just gotten out of the United States Navy, I left with a beat up car and 250 bucks and that's all I had to my name when I went off to start my pro wrestling career. There's a statement from the Obama campaign just been released. It says it's shocking that a candidate for president of the United States would go behind closed doors and declare to a group of wealthy donors that half the American people view themselves as victims entitled to handouts and are unwilling to take personal responsibility for their lives. It's hard to serve as president for all Americans when you've disdainfully written off half the nation. I mean, they've got a point. I, I think it's an embarrassing thing for Mitt Romney, however he tries to spin this. Well, it seems Mitt Romney lately has been saying a lot of embarrassing things, you know, and, and uh, he's certainly not going to endear yourself to 47 percent of the country. And I would think it's going to be quite hard to win. But maybe their plan is that they got these new voter registration laws to where they can deny 45 percent of the country of the ability to vote. <laughs> you know, maybe that's their ultimate plan is to only get to half the country and let only half the country vote in the first place. Because on that note, this whole thing's a farce. Voter fraud is a complete red flag. Mm -hmm. there, there's about as much voter fraud in this country as there is people being struck by lightning bolts. I know that from a governor standpoint. Voter fraud is nothing. And yet they're trying to give everybody an ID card. Poor people would have to pay 35 bucks to go get a state ID. Well, if you're that poor, $35 might be the difference between whether you eat that day or not. Well, what do you think a person's going to do? They're going to go get food if it's that bad. And I think the pathetic thing is that our country is in this kind of shape. And who's responsible? These two major parties. They've been in charge for 150 years. Mitt Romney's had a, a rough week because of the, the Benghazi uh, incident in which he was deemed by most people, including many on his own uh, side, to have jumped in with a critical statement of, of the president, really without knowing all the facts, and turning it into a political football when most people thought that was the wrong thing to be doing oh, I agree. as an American politician at that time. Well, absolutely. When our country's attacked in any way, shape, or form, we need to pull together. We need to come together, not separate at that point. I mean, uh, you want my, what I would do over there? I would do what the pinnacle of the Republican Party, the hero, whatever of modern day, Ronald Reagan, did. Do you recall when our, back in the 80s, when the barracks in Lebanon was hit yep. and over 200 Marines were killed. Did Ronald Reagan go to war? No, he got us the hell out of there. And that's where I stand on this. If these people don't want us over there, let's close our embassies. I stand with Ron Paul. Let's get rid of foreign aid altogether. Because as Ron Paul put it, the definition of foreign aid, that's taking from America's poor and giving it to another country's rich. Yeah, but hang on, hang on, Jesse. Wait a minute. Wait, no, wait, you wait, 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 you wait a minute. Wait, it's my show. Wait, you wait. wait a minute. Hey, hey, let me just challenge I'm talking. you. I'm challenging you. Because right. I think that is taking one extreme and going to the other. It may well be that America has too many embassies, has too much say in too many countries. We're also broke. It's, that's, of course, you're not the only How country. How can we give to foreign aid? You're not the aid. only country that's broke in the world well, right yeah, now. We're giving foreign aid on a basic term for you people. That would be the equivalent. You're losing your house. You're three payments behind on your car. But your cousin Bob from out of state needs to borrow 500 bucks from you. Are you going to send it? Well, it when you can't even make your own house yeah, payments, Jesse, America, we're broke. But, How in debt are we? Well, you're certainly not as broke as many countries around the world. Well, if they're worse and in more debt than us, I want to see a country that can America, say they have more America debt than we do. America remains a superpower. And America sure we are. And all superpowers, I believe, have a responsibility to other countries around the world. Now, it may not be responsible. Really? No. You I don't th think America should have any involvement in any country in the world? Sure, we can have involvement if they ask us. Since when should we be the world's policemen? Why do we have military bases in 160-some countries? We have no, mil no foreign country has a base here. 
Imagine if Hugo Chavez decided to buy a thousand acres of land by Palm Springs and move the Venezuelan military in there. What, what do you think our reaction would be to that? Yet we, we have multiple bases in Korea, multiple bases in Japan, multiple bases in Germany. And Piers, last time I checked, those wars were over 60 years ago. Why are we still there? Well, the argument would be to prevent another war of that nature. <laughs> why, but why would you laugh at that? Isn't because, there a reality that because there are our, lots of people out there who our would like military to harm, harm today, America and its interests? Our military today is so advanced, we can be anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds, minutes or hours. We do not need to be an empire like Rome occupying with our military throughout the world. And if you notice... I'm getting nothing but nods out here, Pierce. You think from America regular would be American safer? City. Would America sure be, safer be safe without Who's, any embassies in any country? I'm not saying to get necessarily to get rid of embassies. Absolutely have embassies. But if these Middle Eastern countries are going to behave towards us the way they do, then let's get the hell out of there and leave them to their own. you got to remember something. I urge people to read the writings of Major General Smedley Butler. General Butler died in the early 40s, but he was the most decorated Marine in history. He won two Congressional Medals of Honor, and he wrote a book called War is a Racket. And in that book, and this was way at the beginning of last century, he said, I didn't defend the American people's freedom. I worked for the United Fruit Corporation. When they went into Central and South America, if they didn't get cooperation, they'd send in the U.S. Marines to get yeah, but that wasn't it. True. Enough of that. Yeah, but that wasn't true about the Second World War, was it? Probably not. No, it definitely wasn't. That right. Was, that was a. But, but your your apples and oranges here. Your apples Hitler. and oranges here. No, 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 How can saying, you compare the saying, Second World War you, to us were, being the strong arm of because, multinational Jesse, corporations? You were effectively telling this audience and the audience at home that wars are always of that nature, and they're not. The reality is sometimes you have to oppress a All bad right. guy. Don't All you? right. Okay. Let's take my lifetime. I was born post World War II. 1951. Mm -hmm. Now, if you count the Cold War and the war on drugs, which the war on drugs is a war, I live four months of the year in Mexico. 20,000 Mexicans, I believe, died last year as a result of the war on drugs. Do you realize we've been at war my entire life? My entire life. Mm -hmm. We have been at war. Is that the role of the United States? Perennial war at war all the time. No, well, I've had enough of it. Let's listen to Jimi Hendrix for a moment, who's on my shirt. Blimey. Jimi Jimmy Hendrix. Hendrix. Quote, quote from Jimi Hendrix, the greatest guitar player ever. the first ever. time they've applauded you in the last ten minutes. All right. It was when you, you Wait, invoked the name Jimmy of Jimi Jimmy Hendrix. Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix. When the power of love overtakes the love of power, then we'll have peace. When the power of love overtakes the love of power... Then we'll have peace. On that, uh, on that musical <laughs> bombshell, we'll take a short break. When we come back, apparently, and I, I'm slightly hesitant to confirm this yet, we'll ask you after the break, you're going to make a run for the White House in 2016. Whoa. Our campaign pain as a secret weapon. And that secret weapon is speaking right now in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Let's take a look. Hello, I'm Mitt Romney. <laughs> and I understand the hardships facing ordinary Americans. For example, this summer, one of my horses failed to medal at the Olympics. So I know hardship. <laughs> Night night. That is the fun at Robin's expense. And back with me now is Jesse Ventura. The new book is Demo Crips and Rebloodicans, No More Gangs in Government. We're going to be live along with our studio audience. Here's the thing. You can flip this round. Everyone's having a laugh at Mitt Romney's expense, and they're all saying Obama's stretching ahead in the polls and so on. But the reality is Barack Obama's been there four years. Unemployment remains at an in incredibly unacceptable a uh, figure of over 8%. Yeah. You've got lots of people suffering, losing homes, jobs, livelihoods. Why should he get another four years? Well, because... However, they... however many gaffes Mitt Romney may be making, yeah. he is a very experienced, successful businessman. Yeah. Could he not do a better job? 
Well, first of all, they, they pose the question, are you better off today than you were four years ago? I would say yes, George Bush and Dick Cheney are gone. So no matter what, we're better off today than we were four years you ago. Can read, for, wait, let's remember something. Let's rephrase something. the question and see how the audience react. How many of this audience personally, financially, feel genuinely better off after four years? If you do, applaud. Okay. And if you, if you don't, applaud now. So, you know, it's probably about 50-50. So half no, of this... I, I got that at about 70-30. <laughs> Let's put it at 60-40. All right, I'll Maybe 60 40. Uh, but whatever it was, certainly a number of people in the room okay. would agree they're not better off. Okay, but let's get to brass tacks here. And again, I'm the independent. In the economy, things that are done three, four, five years ago show up today. So when the recession of 08 hit, which Barack Obama inherited, mm -hmm. Bush did the first bailout. That was because it hit in 08 because of decisions done in 03, 04, when you had a Republican president, a Republican House, and a Republican Senate. George, why, why at the Republican convention, and I ask you this question, why wasn't George Bush allowed to speak, Dick Cheney allowed to speak, because they just left office three and a half years ago after serving eight years. That's unconscionable that they weren't there. Why? The Republicans don't want anyone to remember who caused all this. I said to my wife, at the, wait, at the 08 election, I said to my wife, you know, I wouldn't want it. You couldn't pay me to be the next president any amount of money because whomever it is is going to get the blame for all of what George Bush and Dick Cheney did. Well, and that's precisely what you got. To. Now, has Obama fixed it? No, he has not. But is is Mitt Romney the answer going back to the old Republican ways that caused it in the first place? Americans have very short attention spans. They usually can only remember about a year ago. They need to remember about four, five, well, six years ago of who caused this. Let's go to uh, our first audience member question, Derek Whitehead. Now, Derek, you got a question. On the basis of rumours still flying around, this gentleman may run for office in 2016. What is your question? Well, first, Governor, uh, how you doing? Good. I'd like to uh, thank you for having the guts to... Uh, serve in our armed forces. I think a lot of uh, politicians and so-called statesmen ought to take a page out of your book. Um, well, it's not a requirement. You know, no, let's be fair. It, it's not a requirement to serve in the military to be the commander in chief because he's a civilian. Maybe it's good for a little of experience having done it, but it is not a requirement. The Constitution doesn't say you have to. Anyway, we're not here to call you a hero. That's not my question. <laughs> Go Governor, my question is, um, if you were to run as, uh, as independent, completely unaffiliated from any political party whatsoever, do you feel that that would help or hinder your ability to ultimately gain ballot access in all 50 states? Oh, it'll require you, the people, to do it for me. But you know what? I need to see that. I need to see the American people rise up before I'm going to put my butt on the line again. When will and you put only your butt way, on the line? And the only way that'll Jessica? happen, two criteria must happen. There must be, and I also abhor this ridiculous spending that they do to get elected. It's obscene. It's obscene. And I and I can say that because I think I, I can say that because when I ran for governor of Minnesota, I spent less money to get the job than what I made doing the job. I don't think there's an elected official that can make that statement in the last 50 years. I only raised three hundred thousand dollars to become the governor of Minnesota. The Democrats and Republicans in the same race spent a combined 12 million, and that was back in 98. So Jesse, will you be running or not in 2016? I don't know. I, 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 need to be, I need to have ballot access in all 50 states, and I need some type of guarantee that I will be allowed in the debates, because you cannot win if they won't let you debate, but if you can debate, you can win. Because in Minnesota at the primary, I was only polling between eight to 10%. I was allowed in the debates, seven weeks later, I was the governor of Minnesota. 
You know, they always say, peers in the private sector, competition's good, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what we always hear, well, how come competition isn't good for president? Why has it been 20 years since we've seen any third voice in a presidential debate? Because these two parties will, they make the rules and they will not let anyone else win. So I would require huge help from you, the people, because if I do run, and I, and, and I run to win, I would be the first president elected in this country that would belong to no political party since George Washington, the father of our country. Well, I would, uh, I would love to see you in one of those debates, actually, Jesse. But after the break, we're going to talk to you about Osama bin Laden and whether a Navy SEAL should be allowed to tell his story as one of the uh, SEAL Team 6 has now done. Jesse Ventura and our live studio audience. Let's get another audience question. This time, Oliver Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds, over to you. Good afternoon, Mr. Ventura. Hi. My question to you is, as a former Navy SEAL, do you agree or disagree with the recent release uh, book by the six-member SEAL team and, this, and the objections of the uh, Pentagon? Uh, I don't have a problem with it. The op was over over a year ago. And I feel I have a right to know what went on because our entire military is paid by my tax dollars. And I believe I have every right to know what they spend my tax dollars on. And I also would like to hear from boots on the ground. I don't want to hear from the media what happened in the op. I don't want to hear from bureaucrats in Washington what happened on the op. I would like to hear from boots on the ground, somebody that was, what was actually there so that I can make a determination. But how does it help, Jesse, if, I mean, my brother's a British Army colonel and has done tours of Afghanistan and Iraq and so on. Sure. How does it help operationally if all the guys around are all wondering who's going to put this in a book? I mean, surely well, they all sign up, don't they, to not write about their experiences? Well, he's out now. He's a civilian now. And uh, I, I just, you know, to me, he has the First Amendment rights or he should have them. Uh, if he's not giving away anything that's listed under national security or that could affect anyone in the future operations, I say, why not? Like I said, I'd like to hear from boots on the ground what actually happened there, not some fragmented story that comes out of Washington telling me what happened. So I, I don't have. And besides you, the media and the SEALs themselves have allowed themselves to become like the Green Berets in the 60s and 70s now. I don't like the fact that you even know we exist, because back in the 60s and 70s, nobody even knew who we were. Well, that's out of the bag now. Hollywood's made plenty of films. You've had my friend Dick Marcenko, who created SEAL Team 6. Mm -hmm. He's written a half a dozen books. So if the creator of SEAL Team 6 can write books about what they do, what the heck? If he if he doesn't put in jeopardy anyone, why why is our government so up in arms about that he does this? What we're all agreed on is that the death of Osama bin Laden was a good thing. But but be honest, is America any safer now than it was when he was killed? Or from all we're seeing now in the Middle East, all the uprisings, all the kind of reverse Arab Spring, if you like, are you concerned that it may be a hornet's nest is getting out of control. No, because I think that lots of times these uprisings are orchestrated. I believe, I believe in the works of Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty when he said, nothing just happens, everything is planned. I truly believe that. And so these uprisings that are happening right now, we don't know really who's behind them. They could be our own CIA did we helping know to do it. Right, well, who knows? But did we know who we were backing? I mean, that's one of the key questions. Backing at what? Well, in Libya, in Egypt. I have in, no idea. You know, all these countries. When you, uh, when you oppose a Mubarak or a Gaddafi or something, did we really know who these rebels were? And are we now perhaps well, seeing the, the results of not knowing too well who they are? We're here wanting to give democracy that pe to people who have lived, in my opinion, in the Stone Age. I think the bigger question to ask is, 
here we go, another religious war. Because most every war that happens on this planet is due to the fact of religion. One religion doesn't like the way another religion worships God, so we're going to kill you. Yeah, I love religion, you know, and I say that sarcastically. Well, hang on, I thought, I thought And I say that because I've, Jesse, op I thought, I've openly admitted I'm an atheist. I thought you said earlier that all wars were about, you know, oil and, and corporations. They are, but they're all religious-based, too. So they're all about religion and oil and corporations. Could be, And sure. occasionally getting rid of the Nazis. Yeah. So my point is well, that the wars Nazi, can be, wait, the wars Nazi, can be over wait, many things. Wait. The Nazis was religious too. Look what they did to the Jews. So that brought religion in. Vietnam was religious because Diem, our puppet president, and our country brought a hundred Christian Vietnamese down to the south to be the government. Well, the southern Vietnamese didn't like these religious characters from up north, so they then became the Viet Cong. So... All wars, pretty much in my lifetime, have had some religious basis, but certainly big business gets in there because wars are very profitable to certain big businesses. And of course, big business needs to be in the Middle East so that we can get the oil out of the Middle East, so we can get the lithium out of Afghanistan. You know they discovered a vein of lithium there they say is worth a trillion dollars. Well, what is lithium used for? Every cell phone, computer, and soon-to-be electric cars. Let's talk about why we're really there. We're not there. How does any of these wars affect our freedom in any way? The United States is not in any threat. They're not going to do a Normandy invasion on us, Al-Qaeda in Virginia. No, but hang on, you're being slightly naive, aren't you? Because I'm not being naive, I sir. Are, I think you are being Naive, no. Because I think that it's clear one of the main reasons that America went into Afghanistan was to try and get Al Qaeda dismantled, the organization which committed the 9 11 atrocity. Really? Well, you don't think so? Well, how come Al Qaeda put the heroin business out? They took all the poppy growers and stopped the production of heroin. What would you have done? Wait, now how much of that illegal heroin was propping up the international banks with laundered money and when it dried up, the first recession happened? Well, now that we're back in there, we aligned with the poppy growers and the heroin business is back up full swing okay, again. What I thought we fight a war on drugs here. All right, Jesse, Seems what, would, we're not. what would you have done? on September the 12th, 2001. What would you have done if you'd been president? What would I have done? Yeah. I would have done a legitimate, a legitimate investigation to find out what exactly happened on 9-11. How did they know who did this so quickly like they did Lee Harvey Oswald? How quick they knew Lee Harvey Oswald well, we knew killed because, Kennedy. Because the people who did it were identified and we knew who they were. Well, then why couldn't we have stopped them beforehand if they were identified and we knew who it they were? It was a failure of intelligence. Everyone's accepted No, it that. wasn't. We knew before with Condoleezza Rice's memo on August 6th when it stated right in the memo, bin Laden took steal planes and run them into buildings. And more stuff is coming out now also, how much the Bush administration ignored the intelligence. It was almost like they ignored it because they wanted it to happen. Oh, come off it, Jesse. That's no, ridiculous. not oh, come off it. Every, wait a minute. No. Every war no, no, fought no, no, starts no. with a false flag operation. You can't, in all seriousness, sit there and try and make out anybody. How, okay, let me ask you this, Piers. Wait a minute. Let That's me, wait, wait, wait. Let me ask you something. How many, how much studying have you actually done of 9 11 other than what, what the government's told you and what mainstream media has told actually. you? I was editor, I've been studying it for years. I was editor of a national newspaper. I've, I've talked to Covered it Wait in depth every day for really? five, six months. Really? So I know a lot about it. Well, one then thing how I do come, know is, let me ask you this: you then. cannot say that any member of the Bush administration knew it was going to happen or wanted it to happen. It's a ridiculous thing to say. Ridiculous. Okay, let's talk about your BBC. I have a tape of a BBC reporter broadcasting directly back to England talking about a third building has collapsed. World Trade Center Building Seven talks for twenty. Seven minutes, all the while she's talking 
World Trade Center Building 7 is still standing right behind her. It didn't fall for another half hour, yet they were doing a pre-broadcast back to England no. that, the, yes, it's true, no, you need to that take this a break building here. fell and it hadn't fallen yet. If you're trying to make out the British Broadcasting Company, one of the most respected news organizations in the world, was inventing huge buildings falling over, you, need to, have little, you need to have a break, Jesse. We'll come back after the break Are and we'll talk about Israel me? and you? Iran. Are you kidding me? This is a fact, my friend. That was Jesse Ventura live along with our studio audience. We left a fairly heated debate about various theories that you have about 9 11 and so on. Let's move on to. Oh, and the government only has a theory. Right, well, the government. Uh, has no, this is a theory. Their theory is 19 Islamic radicals armed with box cutters defeated our multi-billion dollar air defense system, mm -hmm. all while conspiring with a bearded guy in a cave in Afghanistan. That is exactly what that's happened. That's their theory. No, that's not a theory. It's a fact. That's their theory. No, Jesse, that's a, a fact. fact. That's what happened. Really? Yes. I'm Were sorry to kill your conspiracy theories, but that is what happened. Then why haven't anyone been brought up for trial? Because they, they all haven't died. given one shred of evidence they all died. in a trial. In case, you, in case you missed the story. Well, they then all what do we died. got all these guys in Gitmo for? And we got the supposed confessor to it, who they waterboarded 180 times to get the confession. Got news for you, peers. If they waterboarded you 180 times, you'd confess to but, it. You see, now you're, but you're missing the point. On that very point, I don't agree with Guantanamo Bay. I didn't agree with the waterboarding, personally. Let's move on. Let's move all on right. to uh, Iran and Israel. If you were the American president, with all the jungle drums beating now about Iran, would you take any military action? Well, first, let me state that Iran has to do this, because if you notice, the United States doesn't mess with any country that's got nuclear capabilities. They only mess with countries that don't. So all countries that don't have it strive to get it because it's a safety mechanism to have it. So of course Iran is going to try to get the Should stuff. Should they be allowed to have them? Should they be allowed to? I don't know. Well, yes or no? I don't know. God, you're a man of opinions. No, I don't. I, I, you I, may be I, running for office. I'm entitled to know what you think. Not right now. You don't. I need to study it more. How very I need convenient. To look. Yes, it is very convenient. So you know about everything that happened before 9-11, but right now when you have Iran potentially nuking itself up, you don't have an opinion. Well, let's leave that up to the nuclear inspectors that go in there. They will tell us whether they're nuking it up before you decide to bomb them. I didn't decide to bomb anybody. No, but you seem to be very favorable You're trying to put words it. into my mouth all the time, which is, it's, it's not a very good technique when you're debating with somebody. Just to stick you're to going, facts. Well, how many political offices have you held? Uh, none. Then don't tell me how to debate, because I've held two. Oh, I've debated many times. But you've never won, you've never won an election where a debate I was required. I think you make some very sensible points, and you make some crackpot points. That's your opinion? Yes. How many people here think I make crackpot points? Yeah. One. How many think I make sensible points? Yeah. You're in a minority, my good friend. You're the minority. Let's. I said you made some sensible points. Let's go to another audience question from Jared uh, Grossman. Ask your question, Jared. Hello, Governor. Yes. I'd like to know why you think that politics in America today why has it become so polarized and why has it become so hate driven and how do you think we can fix that? Well, uh, politics in America, the problem, the major problem is the Democrats and Republicans, as I explain in my book, Democrats and Republicans, no more gangs in government. Uh, they've created a system based completely on bribery. Now, if we do bribery, it's hypocrisy. If we do bribery in the private sector, we go to jail. Yet their entire political system is based upon bribery. Who can bribe and give the most money to the politician? And now, thanks to our illustrious Supreme Court that ruled that corporations have the same rights as individuals and that money is free speech, well, we're now being inundated with so much money from the corporations buying the Democrats and Republicans both sides that... Uh, 
Look at this hypothetically. A foreign country could now control our elections because all they would have to do is form a corporation, start pumping money into the super PACs. Plus, there's no uh, you don't they don't have to say where the money comes from, which is criminal. Every every candidate should have to state openly open disclosure where they get every dollar. You're not getting that now. So the whole system is corrupted now. The Democrats and Republicans are at fault because they've been in charge for 150 years. They can't pass the buck on it. And until they clean up the system, that's what you got. It's bribery. Jesse, I'm shocked. I just agree with every word you just said. <laughs> no, you just want to get the crowd back on your side. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. As I said to you, I agree. I'm teasing you. Yeah. I, I agreed with every word. Yeah. I think the whole super PAC thing is completely out of control. No, it, and I, you're right. In I, the end, China right now could finance a run for the presidential election with one of, uh, of their sponsored people from one of their companies. It's I, I, I think that this ruling could be the downfall of our country. And the only way, the only way we can stop it is to amend the Constitution. Yeah, I That's agree. the only way you can overrule the Supreme Court, and we need to do that. Let's take a break, Jesse. Okay. We'll come back and talk about uh, Clint Eastwood, the empty chair, and gun control. Jesse Ventura and our live studio audience. Gun control. This is something I've been very animated about uh, yep. all this year with all the various gun outrages, especially yep. the uh, appalling thing at the cinema in, in, uh, in Colorado. Yep. Why is it that Americans, to me it seems, so many Americans cannot divorce their right to defend themselves with a gun to the apparent right to go and buy 6,000 rounds of ammunition, high-powered assault weapons, and go and murder Americans? Well, the best thing I can tell you, Piers, is this. Mexico has strict gun control. You cannot own a gun in Mexico. And they had 20,000 people dead last year in the drug cartel wars. But Mexico has a very particular problem involving drugs. I can right. cite you Britain. All right. Average, well, let me just okay. throw it back at you. In Britain, for example, an average of 35 people a year are murdered with guns. In Germany, it's about 40 to 50. France, the same. Spain, the same. Italy, there's a pattern here. America, 11 to 12,000 a year. Yep. This country has more guns than anybody else yep. and more gun murders. Yeah. It, it's inarguable, isn't it? No, not it at is. all. It is. Because, because I was in the Philippines physically the day Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law and made himself a dictator. And the first thing that dictator did he gave the people of the Philippines two weeks to turn in all their guns or it was the death penalty. Now, why would a dictator do that? Why would he make his number one priority when he took over as dictator to disarm the public? The Second Amendment is there, so and it was put in there not for hunting and fishing, like they like to say. Because back when they did it, if you didn't hunt or fish, you didn't eat. It was put in there so the citizens would have the ability, if their government became oppressive, they could defend themselves against oppressive government. And I think that overrules all the gun deaths because let's remember something. A gun is simply a tool. I have a gun safe at home and I've never come home and heard those guns going off on their own. People kill people. All right, how many people here die because of car accidents of drunk driving? Do we go to the Ford Motor Company and tell them stop making these automobiles because people get drunk and kill people it's in a, cars? It's a facile argument. It's a what? It's a facile argument. There's no equivalence between drunk driving 
and lethal firearms. My point Wait is, a minute. I have a no car problem. is a 2,000 pound projectile no that can problem. go 100 Jesse, miles an hour. Jesse, I have no problem with an American believing that their right under the Constitution is that they can defend themselves, especially in their own home if they're being attacked and they have a, a weapon. It's also That's against fine. government. I have a big problem with a disturbed young man, as we saw in Colorado, being able to buy 6,000 rounds of ammunition and a high-powered assault weapon and go into a movie theater and blow away 70 Americans. I have a big problem with that. Well, and nobody else in America in high office seems to share that big well, problem. Well, I'll tell you what, Piers. I have a conceal and carry license. Had I been in there, I would have taken this guy out before he could have killed that many people. Well, I think that, again... But a- because, let's remember, police can't stop crimes. Police show up after they're over. Remember that. So when you talk about me not being able, if there would have been a legitimate conceal and carry in that theater, quite possibly they could have taken this guy out and saved people's lives. Or you lives. could have had the gunfight at the OK Corral in there and lost even more lives, couldn't you? That's what could happen. Anyway, let's take a well, break. Well, what roll of the dice would you like? You'd prefer to be unarmed when he I comes think in? The, Give this, me my weapon when I, he comes in. I think this country needs to do something about its gun laws. I really do. I don't. I think it is There's a... There's already enough gun laws. They're already on the books. Okay. Let's come back and give you... I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm going to give you the last word after this break. <laughs> Back with my special guest, Jesse Ventura, my studio audience. Twitter's gone crazy tonight, rather appropriately. I like this one from Buffalo Jimmy Z, or Z. He says, the moon landing was faked. Apollo 11 landed on Jesse Ventura's bald head. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jesse, you, as usual, you stirred it all up. How do you want to leave this? You've got about 30 seconds well, to give I, me a final I, thought. I promised a dear friend of mine that I'd make this statement too tonight. Republicans are not a political party, it's a mental condition. <laughs> A good friend of mine wanted me to make sure I said that tonight, so I...